Should you still be a long-term investor? Welcome to Common Sense on the Prairie, a podcast dedicated to helping you demystify the sometimes complex topic of money. I'm Adam Cox, Head of Wealth Management for the First National Bank in Sioux Falls. We're a community bank based out of South Dakota. In this podcast, we share expert insights from around the country and stories from our local community to arm you with the tools you need to make better financial decisions. Because the truth is, the more we talk about this stuff, the better off we're all going to be. Today, I'm joined by Paul Lehman. As a vice president and head of the Bank Trust Group at Dimensional Fund Advisors, Paul brings more than 28 years of investment experience to his role within Dimensional's global client group, managing the firm's potential and existing relationships with the bank, wealth management divisions, and independent trust companies. Prior to Dimensional, he was a director of capital management and chief investment officer for a regional bank in the Southeast. The first half of Paul's career was spent as an advisor, while the second half has included responsibilities in division management, portfolio construction, and client education, all within the bank environment. Paul received a Bachelor of Arts from the University of South Carolina. He has also earned the Chartered Financial Analyst designation. Paul and his wife, Carla, are the parents of 19-year-old triplets who have just finished their first year in college. For anyone who wonders what it's like to raise and educate triplets, one glance at Paul's hairline will tell you all you need to know. And for the record, that was your line, not mine. <laughs> Paul. It's nothing I thanks. haven't heard before, though. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> thanks so much for joining me today. I appreciate it. You bet, Adam. It's great to be here. Great to see you again. Yeah, you too. So, all right, let's start off with an easy one. You live in Austin, Texas, which is mm-hmm. a live music uh, powerhouse. So what's your go-to music? What do you like to listen to? Oh, gosh. Uh, I'm probably like a lot of people. It just depends on, you know, what day you ask me. But the the go-to, the default is jam band music. Uh, yeah, really? Fact, <laughs> yes. In fact, uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see this. Uh, this is my mask. Oh. That's the, that's Bertha from the Grateful <laughs> Dead right there, the original jam band. So, uh, wow. Yeah. Any, any band that can just uh, get lost in itself and go for 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, right. I'm there. Nothing like a 45 minute song. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right. Well, it's uh, it's been a crazy year and a few months, right? So we had uh, a really incredible and fast downturn in the market when uh, COVID really hit. Then we had unprecedented financial stimulus and support, uh, followed by a huge uptick in the market where today we're sitting at or near all time highs in the market. So what should we make of the the markets today and our investments? Well, I think the first thing is if it feels like your head is spinning or if it's felt like complete shifting sands for the last 12 to 18 months, you're not alone. I mean, yeah. even those of us, Adam, you're in the same boat. E- even those of us who are quote unquote professionals at this still find ourselves going, wait a second, what's happening here? So right. any emotion that comes from that is completely normal. All of that being said, and this is a little bit counterintuitive, this to me is just markets working really well. These are market, you know, the, the job of the market is to incorporate all the different things that are happening from financial news to geopolitical news, even in, it incorporates emotions that individual investors have. And so the more that's going on in the world, we would expect if markets work well, we would expect a lot of gyrations in the market, a lot of things that the rest that the market's wrestling with. So with everything that was going on, that was the market sort of digesting that news. Now, one of the questions is, is, okay, I understand why the market went down a lot last February and March. The whole world was shutting down. Why in the world did it almost overnight, turn around and go back up. And almost for the most part, it's been going up uh, ever since. That's the part that that has people going, I don't, I don't understand that. Nothing really changed. In fact, if anything, we, st- we were still dealing with more and more economic news as a result of it. We had another spike in the late summer. Market kept going up. This is when it's helpful to understand the perspective that the market has. The perspective that the market has is not what's happening right now. Yes, if something's brand new out of left field, the market reacts right now to it. But then pretty quickly, the market tries to look out into the future. So the market says, okay, can't do anything about yesterday, can't do anything about today. What's the future look like? And so oftentimes what we see, especially what we saw last year, 
just after the big downturn is the market looking post COVID. One thing it was doing. The other thing, if you think about the stocks, the companies that led the market for most of last year, it, were, it was all the companies that was going to benefit, that, were, that would benefit from everybody having to stay at home. So you saw a lot of the tech companies, Netflix, Amazon, Google, all of those companies that really just led the market higher. That's the market saying that there are parts of this economy that are going to do really well given what we have just learned and what we're going through, let's find those, let's find those parts and let's start to move some money that way. And that had enough power to lead the whole market higher. Then in the fall, as soon as it started looking like maybe this vaccination was going to become a reality and more widespread, the market rotated a little bit and it started to shift out of those companies that really benefited from us not being able to leave our homes and back to the companies and the sectors where, okay, when we're all able to go out there again and do things and drive and fly and go to restaurants and shop, which parts of the markets are going to benefit there? And then we started to see the market participants go there. So long way of saying this is just the market figuring stuff out. And the more there is to digest and figure out, the more we would expect some gyrations to happen. Sure. That makes sense. So today's investment news is it's all over the board, right? I mean, we hear the headlines and uh, we see the news articles. You know, we're talking about government spending. We're talking about inflation. We're talking about bubbles, crazy real estate markets, new types of investments. So is is this all new or have we been here before? Uh, here's a really dissatisfying answer. Um, <laughs> yes, it's all new. And yes, we've been here before. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> and uh, what I mean by that is, there's, there has always been innovation. There's been innovation out there in the real world where you and I live and spend our money. There's been financial innovation. Uh, sometimes those innovations have ended up really changing things for the better. And sometimes those innovations have imploded. And so from a perspective of new things coming in, new investment products, as you mentioned, uh, new interest rate environments, new inflation environments, all of those things, the details this time might be different than anything we've seen before. But the market digesting innovation is something that's been happening for as long as there has been innovation, as long as there's been markets for people to reflect their opinions and make their decisions in, even beyond stock markets, by the way, farmers markets and uh, grocery markets and other types of all markets have been dealing with innovation all the time. Uh, there's that famous economist, Joseph Schumpeter, I think I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, who coined the phrase creative destruction, meaning that sort of in with the new, out with the old. And that happens all the time. That happens all the time. So what does that mean now? What does it mean for questions like, are, are interest rates driving markets? Are interest rates driving markets beyond what is quote unquote, rational. Those questions are natural questions to ask. They're questions that we get all the time. So what's a helpful way to think about it if I'm an investor sitting at home trying to make sense of all of this? The market is, is doing its job. The market is saying we at right now, we are in a very low interest rate environment. And what market participants do is they survey all of their options for their individual objectives and what, they're, what they want the money to do for them. And they'll allocate their money to the, to the place that feels like it's going to, do, to give them the highest odds of success. Yeah. Sometimes that's just total safety of money. I just can't lose a dime. Okay, that's still not going to go to the stock market, even though interest rates are really low. Sometimes it's building wealth for 40 years from now. That money was probably always going to go to the stock market in some respect. Yeah. So... We know that interest rates, I'm just picking that one, Adam. And if you want to talk about other specific things that might be going on, I'm just referencing interest rates right now. Yep. If we just want to talk about interest rates, yes, interest rates are making a difference. Interest rates, though, have always made a difference. And, and interest rates make a difference to different people in different ways. And I hope that's making sense. So it's you can't just say, well, interest rates are low, therefore, this is going to happen to stocks and that's going to happen to bonds. 
interest rates are low, and that means something different for me and what I'm trying to accomplish than it might for you and what you're trying to accomplish. So interest rates are always part of the story, but they don't dictate everything. So I think we, it's, we need to be a little bit careful about saying, well, interest rates are doing X and therefore Y must happen. We, you and I have been talking for years, I know, about the low level of interest rates. Yep. I remember we can go back to the financial crisis. What was that now? 08, 09, 13 years ago. And for almost from the very beginning of that crisis, we were talking about when this ends, interest rates will go back up. They have to go back up. They can't stay this low forever. Here we are 12 years later, 13 years later, interest rates are still very low. And that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of interest rates, let's pull on that thread a little bit longer. Um, you know, interest rates are historically low right now, which is great if you're trying to finance something, right? Um, but the inverse is, you know, our savings accounts and checking accounts are paying nothing. Uh, CDs, money markets, nothing. Bonds next to nothing. So with that backdrop, what are we supposed to do with our safe money these days? Hmm. You use the right word there, safe. Uh, and I think that you, the, 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 the touchstone to always sort of remember when you are very tempted to do something different with your safe money is to remember what it is there to do. It's there to be there when you need it to be. And oftentimes that's just some indeterminate point in the future. Sometimes it's a very determinate point in the future. If you have children who are getting ready to go to school, you might say, in five years, I'm going to need this money. You and your financial advisor will have to decide the right way to allocate all of your finances to, to make sure that you're ready for that, the, you know, that goal, that time frame. But the, 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 the part of the money that is meant to be there when you need it should be treated very differently than the part that is there to grow. There is, in our business, there's the old um, eat well at night versus sleep well at night. Um, and there are, that's, those are different roles for money. The safe money is the sleep well at night. So our suggestion would be, when, whether you're talking about bonds or savings accounts or anything, anything that you're considering for the safe money, is you almost sometimes just have to hold your nose at the low interest rates you're getting and just remember that that's there for a very particular reason. It has a very particular role in an investment portfolio. And oftentimes, in addition to being there when you need it, the other role is to offset the volatility that we often see in the stock market on the stock side of the portfolio. And when the market is going up and the, some element of safety seems to almost creep into the stock side of the portfolio, that's when the biggest temptation is to say, yeah, but OK, so what about that other sleepy side of the portfolio that's just not growing at all? Shouldn't we take some of that and do something a bit riskier with it? Again, that's a determination for you and your financial advisor to make. Uh, the only advice that I would give is to really be careful about doing something that is, quote unquote, unsafe with the safe money. It, just remember what the role is of that portion of the portfolio and you'll be fine. Uh, I think here's another old phrase, and I'll, I'll paraphrase because I can't remember exactly how it goes, but more damage has been done to investors when they reach for yield. In other words, when they take their safe money and they just can't help themselves, they want to they goose those returns a little bit more, more damage has been done to the whole portfolio when that happens than when the stock market gyrates by 15 or 20%. So that's something that's really helpful to keep in mind. Uh, you know, I've mentioned financial advisor a couple of times. More often than not, in my experience, it, it, the title should actually be financial counselor as opposed mm. to financial advisor. Yeah. Because I think that's when, Adam, you and your team, that's, that's, that's really when you're worth your weight in gold is when somebody is tempted to do something a little different with their money because of a current environment. And we start to forget about what the long-term goals were, or even the short or the intermediate-term goals. We start to lose sight of that. That's when that financial advisor, financial counselor really does their job. They're really very valuable. And just saying, before we consider doing anything different, let's go back and revisit 
all of the reasons why we established the account this way in the first place. What goals you had in mind, what risk tolerance you had, how comfortable with you were you if you know your $100,000 went to $85,000? Let's go back and ask all of those questions again. Now, if you're going to answer those questions differently now, okay, well then perhaps it's time to make some change to your asset allocation. But my guess, you would tell them if all of those answers are the same, we're invested exactly the right way. This is a good thing. You can go out of this office today. You can sleep well at night. You know things are established exactly the right way. This is good. This is what we're after. Yeah, that's a great point. It's a question I like to ask uh, a lot of our, our guests is, you know, what is the benefit of working with a financial advisor? You, you've touched on some of that. You know, we are often telling folks that there will be times where, um, you know, you might not think an advisor adds a lot of value because markets are good. Maybe they don't want to be heard from, all those sorts of things. Um, but there are other times, and we've gone through a couple recently of great stress and, and great euphoria where an advisor can add outsized returns. And Dr. Daniel Crosby, who I had on the show recently, he talked about those periods of time where the advisor can add the most value in those concentrated periods generally are going to make up for the fee that you'll pay them many, many times over, over your entire lifetime working with that advisor. Do you see it the same way or do you have anything else to kind of add to why it's important to work with an advisor? Well, probably unsurprising uh, to you. I completely agree uh, <laughs> with that sentiment. Yeah. I, I do. You know, it's interesting. Uh, there's a, there's a, Famous professor, famous in our circles anyway. Uh, his name is Ken French. I know that's somebody that you heard of, have heard of. He's a uh, professor at Dartmouth, longtime researcher. Doesn't have a Nobel Prize yet, but should have one one day if it were up to me. If I were the committee, uh, he, he would have one. He knows more than almost anybody about how to construct an investment portfolio, about how markets work, about having the right perspective on things. And he has a financial advisor, he and his wife do. And the financial advisor for him is not in the building the right investment portfolio. It's in all the other things that a financial advisor does. It's in yeah. connecting the dots in that constellation of a financial plan. It's life insurance, it's changing tax laws, it's estate plans, it's you name it, anything that has to do with financial well-being, a financial advisor has purview over. So to me, Adam, the, the, the fee that you mentioned, if the fee is just about, I don't know, outperformance uh, of a benchmark, okay, then, then that's completely commoditized the role of a financial advisor, and it'll always go to the cheapest option. I'm suggesting that's the wrong way to think about the role of a financial advisor. Let's get back to that, that notion of financial counselor. For somebody to walk into your office and say, there's a lot that's going on in the world. Yes, my investment portfolio is being impacted, it seems like, but what about all these other things that I should be worried about? When you can address those other things, when you can partner with other advisors in, in other areas of expertise, and then come back and provide a level of peace of mind, that is what the fee is for. That's what the fee, that's, that peace of mind is really what every investor is after. They might voice it differently, but every time they're either jubilant or depressed or whatever, anything in between about what's going on in the markets, it's peace of mind that they're after. And that's the role of the financial advisor. We used to say when I worked for the bank before I came to Dimensional, we had to remind ourselves as we got together as an internal group that nobody on their deathbed, as they're gathered around with all their friends and family and loved ones, nobody ever said, and, and best of all, we beat the S&P 500 by 75 <laughs> basis points. <laughs> you know, they, you know, they, they don't. Yeah. They're, they're, they're recalling all of the good, hopefully, and this is maybe an idealized ver uh, picture in my mind, but they're recalling the good times that they had. Uh, they're able to look at their spouse and say, don't worry. Remember the life insurance that we bought before? You're going to be just fine. They can look to their children 
who have their own children and they can say, we funded the 529 plans. They can look at their, their pastor, their priests, and they can say, uh, we've made provisions for new pews in the sanctuary. All those are the things, that's what money's for, Adam. That's, we, we get wrapped up in almost what's the, what's the size of the stack of the hundred dollar bills that I can put in front of me on a table. And we lose sight of what that's really meant to provide for us. And what it's meant to provide is a quality of life. It's, it's meant to provide that peace of mind. If the more money you have, the more you're worried about money, then we're missing the point here. We, yeah, we, right. we are. I mean, the point of having money is to not have to worry about having money. Yeah. But we're human beings. And so we do get worried about it. That's what the role of the financial advisor is. It's not to pick Coke instead of Pepsi. It's not, frankly, even to pick one mutual fund company over another. It's to do, it's to provide for their clients the peace of mind that lets them go enjoy the life that the money is intended to provide. Yeah, that's great. So recently, client and prospect meetings have changed a little bit for us um, with what's going on in the markets. We've started getting different questions and we've got them before. This is, again, all things are not necessarily new, but they've, they've, we've, we've been here before. I, I, I've started to get two questions recently. One is, is this a market top? Which I think is, goes to explaining why, you know, people are a little confused why the market is as high as it is right now. And also, is this a bubble? You know, they're kind of remembering back to 08, 09 and some of the things and seeing some of the, the activity in the housing market, things like that. And they're a little bit concerned. So wh- what do you say to, to those questions? Well, uh, it, again, natural questions to ask. It, it, the, the, the notion of trying to understand where the market's going to go next is, I don't know if I'm going to call it impossible, but I'm going to om- call it almost impossible. And it's not because r- really smart people can't figure really complicated things out. It's because the market is so good at processing new information. So good at processing new information. Now, okay, so let me say, because it's so good at processing information, that makes trying to predict what's going to happen tomorrow or what's coming around the corner impossible to do. What changes markets is just new information. Now, that doesn't have to be new interest rate levels. That doesn't have to be the Fed just came out today and bumped interest rates or lowered interest rates. It doesn't have to be some big geopolitical event. Yeah, when those things happen, markets respond to it. It can also just be sort of the aggregation of emotions that that individual investors have or professional investment managers have. So questions like, are we at a top? I don't know. Again, dissatisfying answer. I don't know if we are. Uh, Is this a bubble? I don't know. You first have to define for me what a bubble is. If we're going to start to have conversations about is this a bubble or not, I'm not even sure I know what a bubble is. Let me ask you, like, how would you define a bubble? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's kind of like that old saying, you know, when you see it, yeah. um, but only in the rearview mirror. Yep. So when you're in the middle of one, I don't know that anyone, there's plots, there's lots of people that the prognosticators that are always going to say, this is a bubble, this is a bubble. And, and there's also an equal number of people who are saying, this is the bottom, this is the bottom, right? So I think when you're in the middle of one, I don't know that you can define it, but after yep. it bursts, you go, oh, that was definitely a bubble. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm also going to give an equally dissatisfying answer that <laughs> is to say, I don't know. Yeah, it's tough, yeah. To, uh, it's, it's tough to pin down. So I think, you know, the, it, while it's natural to ask that question, we have to understand that what we're really after are things that we should, as fiduciaries, be doing for clients, given the evidence that we have. Yep. And if you and I, who have been in this business for a long time, can't agree on maybe what a bubble is, or we certainly can't ag- agree on when it's going to end, what should we be doing as, as advisors to investors when the markets are at all-time highs? 
Well, I think we have to remember one thing we have to remember is let's let's every time a, a stock is transacted, changes hands, let's remember that there is both a buyer and a seller. And what's tempting to when when markets get to all-time highs, it's tempting to think, well, now it's all of the I don't know, the 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 less educated, less experienced, people who are just gamblers, people who are just rolling the dice, they're the ones that are buying. And the smart money is selling to those people. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's, it's, it's referred to as the greater fool theory. Yep. I'll just keep holding to this until finally, you know, there's somebody else who is willing to take this off my hands. I think that does the markets a disservice when we think about it that way. Are there times when that happens? Sure. Are we seeing it in something like cryptocurrency? I don't know. So obviously, yes, there are times. That, but again, what we're talking about, I think, is a taking a step back and just looking at the market or looking at that part of my investment portfolio that's invested in stocks. Let's remember that most transactions that happen on stock exchanges now, are it's one quote unquote professional investor trading with another professional investor. Yeah, This is one giant mutual fund company trading with another giant mutual fund company or one big pension plan with another big pension plan. These are true professionals who are, who are behind these buy or sell decisions. And they are armed with all of the data and all of the research and all of the evidence that anybody could ever hope for. And so one person who owns a stock currently, they've done all of this research, man, they've looked at it every way they know how. And they look at the price and they say, at this price here, I think it's fully valued, quote unquote. I'm, I'm going to, I think the future is down rather than up, at least in the short term. Okay. So they go to market, they own the stock, they're looking for somebody to buy it. On the other side comes another professional investor who also has access to all of the data and all of the research and all of those things. They've looked at the exact same company and come to the exact opposite conclusion. That the future is brighter, that the stock's going to go up. So these are this, that's what a market is, just a buyer and a seller. And so market, any given level of the market doesn't in and of itself say, so therefore something must happen tomorrow. And we, we've actually done a big study on this. We looked back uh, over the last several decades and we looked at just the S&P 500, just the large cap US-based part of the global stock market. And at the end of every month, we, we put a little marker on it if it, was, if it closed that month at an all-time high. Okay, And then we said, what happened one year, three years, five years after that? When the markets were at all-time highs, when it closed a month at an all-time high, one year later, it was higher at a bigger percentage, more often than it was when we looked at just any old closing price of the month. Mm. In other words, the persistency remained strong for the markets one year, three years, five years later. If we look at it a different way, look at it, the returns that the S&P 500 generated, the return of the S&P 500 one year later was roughly 14%. The S&P 500's average return going back through time is roughly 10%. So just because the market was at an all-time high a year ago did not mean at all that on average the return was lower or the experience was worse one year later. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but there's nothing that says because we're at all-time highs right now, the market must go down. It will go down because that's what markets do, but it doesn't have to go down simply because of where it closed yesterday. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. All right, you, you mentioned it, so let's go there. It's a touchy subject. What the heck should we make of cryptocurrencies? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me about the Grateful Dead. Uh, again. No. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> cryptocurrencies, my goodness. Uh, well, uh, you know, I, this was probably two or three weeks ago. My son, my 19-year-old son, as you mentioned, uh, informed me that he had bought one of the cryptocurrencies okay. uh, <laughs> completely without me uh, knowing. Yeah, and and I asked him why, and he said Elon Musk is going to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said it's been going up a lot recently, and he said if it goes down, it's going to go back up. Now, 
as you might imagine, as a <laughs> financial advisor uh, and father for this person, yeah. I, I, I had to take a minute to just think about what's the right way to respond. I didn't want to just say, you know, all three of those things that you said are exactly the wrong reason to invest in anything. Right. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> uh, but I, so I, I asked him the difference between gam- what he thought the difference between investing and gambling was. Yeah. And then I also asked him what he thinks makes for a good investment. If you just take all of the current stuff out of the picture and just what, what's your intuition about something that should go up through time? And that conversation right there, I think, is a really good way to think about cryptocurrency. We had, and I'll, by the way, should preface all of this with saying I am absolutely no expert on this. But we did have an expert in for a webcast a few weeks ago, and this is a Harvard professor, and he, the whole conversation was about cryptocurrencies, and it was fascinating. And he kind of broke it out into three different things. You know, you've got, you've got cryptocurrency as an idea, you've got blockchain technology as a technology, and then you've got Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin, as manifestations of those things. And he said, you can almost think of those things as as three different, I don't know, frameworks when you're asking yourself, should I, what should I be thinking about cryptocurrency? In his opinion, cryptocurrency ultimately will be something that will be a good thing for us to consider, for companies to consider, for governments to consider. He doesn't know if it's there now or not, but ultimately he likes the, the idea and he likes the technology. He thinks there's great promise to it. But that's different than saying, and Bitcoin is going to be the one that, that rolls. He said, right now, there's an awful lot of just pure speculation that's going on. And our, our, the founder of Dimensional, David Booth, uh, we, we, there was just an uh, article that he published. I guess it was, he was being interviewed and he was asked about Bitcoin and is it a bubble and all of those things. And his response was, well, it doesn't have any, anything on which you can value it. There's no future earnings stream that you can look at and then compare it to whatever other fundamentals you, you want price or, you know, uh, the value of the company or anything like that. It doesn't have anything up that you can sort of evaluate its long-term worth, which means almost by definition, we're just speculating that that's going to be the one. And in reality, there are so many different iterations of how that technology and how that idea can be applied. We just don't know. We don't know. Is it Bitcoin? Is it Dogecoin? Is it Ethereum? Is it? There's just no way to know. And you, when you add in the layer, I think we've seen recently of some governments who are starting to step in to this, this whole conversation, we don't know what impact that's going to have. So the way I'm choosing to think about it is it's a technology that I ought to sort of start to understand better than I do. It's probably something that I ought to get comfortable with, but I probably should not get wrapped up sitting here today in which of these currencies is going to be the winner. Which should I bet on? Because I'd be doing exactly that. I'd be betting. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned Elon Musk. That's one opinion. It's a big opinion. It is. Um, that, that can move move markets, as we've seen. Um, you know, we live in a world full of opinions, and now we have forums on which to share them really readily. Mm-hmm. Um, how should investors separate news from noise? Oh, there's another big one. That's that's tough. One thing I th- I think the most important thing they could do, investors could do, is work with a financial advisor, find a financial advisor. Because the financial advisor, if it's, if it's a good one, you know, if it's one that, that is doing things the right way, they have aligned their entire careers with, with your, with the investor's well-being. The goals are the same. So often where we're wrestling with this signal and noise, it's because we've just watched something on television or we've just read something online in a forum, or we've just talked to a friend who's got an investment idea. The, the problem with that, again, I'm not suggesting that, that those aren't well-meaning people doing things, 
but they, they're not you. They don't know you. They might have completely different objectives in mind, completely different perspectives on the world. So one, the, the, the best way to separate that signal from the noise is to try to tune that stuff out as much as possible. If I were to go back, I started in business in 93, Adam, if I were to go back and do that over again, there is one bit of advice that I would put into every single conversation, even if it was just a, hey, how's the weather? I would end every <laughs> conversation this way. And that would be, turn off the TV. Yeah. <laughs> turn off the TV. Yeah. Uh, that particular venue is driven by even, even more uh, of its own initiatives. They're there to propagate emotions and opinions because they're for-profit businesses. Those yeah. networks hope to make a profit. They make profits by selling a ton of advertising and charging more for the advertising they can sell. How do they do that? They get two people on there who disagree with one another and they start yelling at one another and it becomes theater. Yeah. Right? It becomes theater. Yep. And so our emotions get, just get worked up. I'm sure if we were all wearing like neuro brain scanners watching that happen, all kinds of stuff would be lighting up. Uh, and so, and that's completely intentional, completely intentional. So the idea is to ramp up emotions. Remember what we talked about earlier, peace of mind is the number one goal. We're trying to do exactly the opposite. We are trying to calm folks down, to help them understand that with the right guidance, it's going to be okay. It's going to be as fine as it can be. There's no reason to spend your waking hours subjecting yourself to that sort of anxiety. And I know we try to write it off as well. It's, I know they're just, they're just being entertainers on TV. Yeah, but it's getting in there, man. I mean, it's, it's, it's planting seeds in there. And again, turn off the TV would be the best way to try to separate the signal from the noise. Option 1B or the next thing that you should do is find a good financial advisor that you trust. One of the things I used to tell clients is I think investors, in some respects, maybe they give themselves too much credit at, at being really good investors. But more frequently than that, they don't give themselves credit enough. And what I mean by that is if, if I'm an investor and I'm talking to you and I don't know how to do any of this stuff. I know how to do what my job is really well, but I don't know how to do this stuff. And I walk in and you tell me whatever you tell me. And there's a conversation that ensues. I'm still not going to walk out of that meeting one hour later and feel like I'm an expert when what's going on. But probably what I've been doing as you've been talking to me is nodding along. Yes, that makes sense. Oh, of course. Sure. Yeah. I read about that once. You know, I'm saying all of those things. But there's a voice inside me that is telling me whether this makes sense or not, just intuitively. It's like just in the heart rather than in the head. Something's telling me, I trust Adam. This makes sense to me. I don't have to be an expert in this. I don't have to pretend that I'm an expert in this. And I think it's all going to be just fine. Listen to that voice. That's what I would say. That's what I said to, to clients in the past. That's what I would say to investors now. Pay attention to that voice. And if the voice is still asking you questions, keep talking. You don't have to make the decision to work with that financial advisor. Keep talking, keep asking them questions. And eventually that voice will either say, I'm, I'm still not comfortable or that feels right. When that happens, that's, I think, one really good signal that you are with the right person. Yeah, that makes sense. So I've always thought investing should be boring. Is that just because I'm boring or am I onto something? Uh, yes and yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, you know me well. Yeah. <laughs> this is why you're so good at your job. You're just a yeah, naturally boring person. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> no, that's not true, by the way. I know you. Uh, that's not true. Uh, you know, it should be boring. It should yeah. be. It, it, this, is, this is something that should, should take decades, not days. It, this journey, this financial journey. It really should. And it should not feel like a roller coaster as the default feeling. There will be times when it does, especially in the stock market. That's okay. That's why the stock market 
over time has given you a bigger return than something like a savings account or a government bond has more roller coaster along the way. So, but barring that, knowing, having the expectations before you even invest your first dollar that it's going to feel that way sometimes, the rest of it should just feel like this is just nature doing its thing. Stocks go up, they go down, interest rates go up, they go down. There's no reason that I should get wrapped up in anything that's happening right now. If I am feeling nervous, let me schedule some time with the financial advisor. We'll make sure that everything is, is still arranged the right way. And then again, ideally, walk out of that office and go back to living my life. So I do, there is a, a Senator Bill Bradley, um, any of the viewers and listeners may be familiar with that name. He's, uh, he, he's a friend of the firm. He's done a lot with Dimensional uh, over the years, and he's always just been very attracted to the way that we invest. But he said something once that has always stuck with me. And he said, if you can change the way you view markets, then you can change the way you live your life. And that is so profound. I mean, there's a reason that that guy is, is just conquered everything he's, other, uh, he's ever tried. So if you can change the way you view markets, you can change the way you live your life. If you view markets as a day-to-day -day sprint sort of a roll of the, the roulette wheel, and I need to know when to take all my chips off and when I need to go all in, you're never going to find that peace of mind. You just won't. Uh, it's, there's too much to sink your teeth into on a daily basis with, with investing. If, however, you can think of investing more as a journey, and you've got a guide with you in the financial advisor, and that most of the things that happen in your investment journey are going to be completely out of your control. There's nothing that you're going to be able to do to change most of the things that you encounter along your journey. And instead, you can just have confidence that you're doing the right thing through, again, the relationship with the financial advisor. You've just changed the way you can live your life. You don't have to spend time worrying about the markets anymore. You can instead go live your life. Again, do the things that the money's there to enable you to do in the first place. And I think that's a really good way to think about it. It's, it's, it's not easy because we're humans. We're emotional people. We are wired with that whole fight or flight thing, fear and greed thing. It's just who we are. We might as well just understand it and get comfortable with it, which means things like that I'm saying here today aren't easy. But if there is a commitment to view the markets and to view that investment journey in the right way and a commitment to aligning yourself with somebody who can really help makes all the difference in the world. All right, Paul, last question for you. Let's talk to our younger investors a little bit because we've got a lot of young, uh, young folks that listen to this podcast. What should they be thinking about these markets? They've got a really long time horizon, right? And things are a little bit crazy right now. How should they be approaching these markets? Uh, really good question. And obviously one that I wrestled with, with my son, uh, hmm. with the whole cryptocurrency thing, I, I got to tell you, um, the first thing I would suggest that they do is go back and listen to your podcast with Morgan Housel. That was fantastic. You guys had a really great conversation just about how to arrive at big decisions, financial decisions. And it's not always financial. It's oftentimes behavioral. Those two things together are going to inform what you do. And you guys just had some great tips. So number one thing is go back and listen to that podcast you did with Morgan. That was fantastic. Uh, the, the other thing, and maybe I'll apologize a little bit if I'm maybe being too, uh, I don't know, focused on what's going on now. And I'm, maybe I'm painting with a broad brush how all young people think about investing. In fact, I'm sure, I'm sure I am, but I, it's, it's, it's what everybody's talking about right now. It's, it's this notion of the meme investing and, um, you know, the platforms, the trading platforms, and it's not just one, there's several that make it easy for people to invest quickly. So the first thing I would say on the positive side, I actually think that this, these platforms that have lowered the barriers, I actually think that's a positive thing. 
I think anytime we can democratize, if you will, access to markets, we're all going to be better off for that. Might not feel like it right now, but I think we're all going to be better off. So the fact that any of us, but especially young people, can get started investing now and have fewer frictions than you and I had when we started investing is ultimately a good thing. So how do we help them sort of get started on the right path? Well, the first thing is I would say, don't meme invest. Yeah. Uh, again, <laughs> right. under, understand yes. what's happening there. And that, and you know, the whole GameStop thing is a, is a great case study in just how much things can be influenced by some outsized personalities. I mentioned Elon Musk before, but they're also just the people who are on the, you know, in the forums that were expressing their opinions one way or another. And it was really easy to get wrapped up in what was happening. But the, I think the more you get wrapped up in this and the more you start saying, I'm gonna, I don't know, you know, he's gonna be on Saturday Night Live on Saturday, let's watch, the more that starts to feel like gambling as opposed to investing. So don't invest based on memes. Invest based on things that you know, things that are intuitive to you, things that you can, that have a solid story to them. The second thing is to learn how, train yourself how to delay gratification. It's the hardest thing as a human being, regardless of your age, to, to come to grips with. I don't care if we're talking about uh, exercising or eating a certain way or investing. It's almost universally true that the things that are worthwhile to you are short-term pain, long-term benefit. And it's almost universally true that the things that are most harmful to you are long-term, are short-term benefit, long-term pain. And I think thinking about investing in that way and training yourself to delay that instant gratification of, well, I put money in today, a couple hundred bucks today, and I've already, I'm already up 200 bucks. And that's what I'm looking for. I just need to replicate that time and time again. Uh, that's going to be, it's going to make your investment journey just laden with anxiety. So let's delay gratification. And, pro and the last thing is, and, and I, you know, it's this notion, it's related to delaying gratification, but it's this notion of understanding the power of long-term compounding of returns. Understanding it not just in investing, understanding it in your own work life, your own career. Don't be real anxious to go get that next job before you've had enough time to really get good at this one, to really understand this one. And the reason isn't because I don't, I'm opposed to you making more money or advancing, but there is something that accrues in your career that ultimately will take you to the highest level that you can go to. And if you shortchange that process, you're probably not going to get the opportunities. You're not going to have experienced the benefit of compounding returns. In investing, it's exactly the same way. I think Charlie Munger, uh, I think it's Charlie Munger, who says, that in reference to compounding interest or compounding returns, that it's almost a miracle. But those who understand the power of compound returns earn it. And those who do not understand it, pay it. And if young people, if old people can grab <laughs> onto these concepts and really discipline themselves to, to internalize them, I think it all works out just fine. Yeah, I agree. Paul, awesome conversation. Thank you so much for doing this. And good news, this episode was still shorter than a Grateful Dead song. So <laughs> we got that going for us too. <laughs> I appreciate it, Paul. All right. Thanks, Adam. I hope you found this helpful. If you did, please subscribe and share with your family or friends. If you have a topic you want us to cover in future episodes, send us a note through our website. And if you're at the point where you want an expert opinion on your finances, reach out and we'd be happy to start a conversation. And remember, any comments, insights, or strategies discussed on this podcast are intended to be general in nature and therefore may not be suitable for you and your situation, whatever that may be. Before acting on anything we discuss, please consult with your attorney, CPA, and or your financial advisor.